Support for Exploring the American Spirit is provided by Sassy Shears, Riverside Salon, Spa, and Boutique, where clients can spend an hour or an entire day. Hair, nails, skin care, and massage for adults and children. More online at sassyshears.com. I'm Mary Parks. American spirit. Say those words and many images come to mind. You may think of heroic acts in times of tragedy, a person or an entire family that overcomes adversity. In reality, selfless acts by ordinary individuals that help others take place every day in every part of our country. They aren't likely to make the headlines, but their impact is just as real, and the effect on our communities is just as powerful. At Exploring the American Spirit, we're going to take a look at some of the phenomenal accomplishments done by people who saw a need and found a way to meet it. I'll be your guide on this incredible journey, so pull up your chair and relax as we explore the American spirit. Two hours east of Los Angeles, a vast blanket of white hangs heavy over the San Bernardino National Forest. Rolling clouds of moisture and mist cloak the treetops. The aroma of the beautiful trees surrounds us, the air ice cold, the perfect kind of day to spend looking for a very special eagle named Jack. Okay. Boy, snow's pretty deep. <laughs> At least somebody's already made tracks for us. <laughs> What's the likelihood we'll see an eagle? Well, I think it's fairly likely because I thought we saw one out on the ice. Looking for Jack is something Robin Eliason has been doing the past four winters. She's been a district wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service at the Mountaintop Ranger District since 1989. That eagle just looked through. Watch that eagle. Just at the water's edge of Grout Bay in a town called Fawnskin, two American bald eagles sit side by side, hoping for a meal of ducks and fish. Man-made pesticides and the environment weren't always so kind to our national bird. In the 1970s, the bald eagle was placed on the endangered species list. With official protection of the U.S. Congress and a concerted effort and perseverance of the U.S. Forest Service, an example of the American spirit in action, the eagle population is now thriving. At this point, bald eagles are doing so well. They've really recovered and they're nesting in all, all of the states, the lower 48 states and Alaska. Um, and so we continue to do the counts just because it's so much fun. It's a way to engage the public and an opportunity to show them a bald eagle, which is a really exciting thing to see. Each winter, the U.S. Forest Service asks the public to volunteer for an hour-long session to observe the birds as they soar majestically in the sky or sit in their nests. Anything? Yeah, there's uh, both adults are down there. And there's a hawk eating some of their leftovers. The breathtaking view of Big Bear Lake is what brought Sandy Steers here. She's a Hollywood screenwriter of action and adventure films who traded the traffic of L.A. for a spotting scope. Well, I was always doing the counts with the Forest Service when they do them, you know, four times a year. But after the first chick was hatched, I kind of got addicted to standing out with my scope watching the nest and, I can and see why. seeing what it was doing. And... Uh, by the end, I kind of felt like we knew each other from <laughs> staring at each other for so long. Um, and they know. That's funny they about do. eagles. Mm -hmm. They look like they're watching us. Yes. Yeah, I think they are. They have really good eyesight. To put that into perspective, Steers says an eagle's eyesight is seven times better than that of a human. So sharp, 
Eagles can see a newspaper at the end of a football field, hence the phrase eagle-eyed. These eagles are so majestic and large. Their wingspan is seven to eight feet. Now a human's wingspan is the same as your height, in my case, six feet. So imagine two more feet at the ends of my arms. Our cameras were fortunate enough to catch a few minutes of this majestic creature, recognized throughout time as a sign of strength, power, and independence. Spotters have counted seven bald eagles this winter in Southern California. The breathtaking national symbol happened to line up in the sky on this cold winter morning with a commercial jetliner flying at an altitude of some 35,000 feet above the forest. Watching the eagles is just awesome. It's like a feeling that's hard to describe, but it, it feels like I'm privileged to be able to see something in nature that most people don't get to see. And I'm just fascinated with watching their behavior and watching the parents take care of the chicks and watching them feed them and taking turns on the nest and how it's like they're considerate with each other and with the chicks and it's amazing to watch their behavior and watch the chicks grow up. I start to feel like I know them. Well, you've been doing this since 2000. Do you think they recognize you? I do. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but after the first chick that was in the nest, Jack, um, after uh, she had fledged, uh, a couple months later, she was hanging around the area and I was up here watching the nest and she came and landed in a tree nearby me and it, it just felt like she was saying hello, you know, because we'd always been so far away that she came close to, you know, to say that she knew I was there. Steers felt such a connection to the eagle chick affectionately named Jack that she helped raise money to install a solar-powered nest camera. The Bald Eagle Nest Cam carries a live video stream capturing not only pictures but audio as well. Although striking in appearance, what makes Jack so revered that self-proclaimed bird nerds like Sandy and Robin keep looking for Jack every winter? But I would still like to see Jack. I know. We meet Barb Roberts in a prime eagle-watching spot known as Windy Point. Jack, as it turns out, was her father's name. He had such a love for nature and a passion for the, the grandeur of the mountains. And he loved fishing. And when there was a chance to see the majesty of bald eagles, he took that opportunity. And he shared that with you. He instilled that into me, and I, I've loved nature ever since. Jack Lubecki had a sort of spiritual connection with the eagles. He never missed a winter count in 20 years. Jack would marvel at the shape of fallen snow on the mountaintops while patiently watching from Windy Point, which had the best view of the trees where an eagle might nest. The winter of 2010 would be his last. Jack Lubecki died at the age of 87. The mountain's most seasoned spotter was gone. And not long after, Rangers watching the eagle cam discovered a tiny beak and feathers peering from the nest. It was a big day and a natural that the new eagle chick would be called Jack. And how important is it for you to come up here and continue that learning and legacy of your father's? There's nothing like it, especially when I'm here by myself. He's with me. So when I'm here alone during that eagle count, it's the best feeling in the world to be close to him. Sometimes it was just the two of them. Other days, Jack loved to teach what he called the newbies about the American bald eagle. When those brand new people came out, he could give them the excitement of seeing an eagle for the first time and making them be really quiet and listen for the eagle sound so then we could start searching. And Yeah, that was his joy. December through March, the U.S. Forest Service holds several eagle counts where the birds are likely to gather. Spotters, no doubt, will be looking for Jack and enjoying our enduring national symbol, the American bald eagle. Few high school freshmen have achieved quite the record of giving back and making a difference for others, an example of the American spirit in action as young Jacob Fish. I've always really loved helping out other people. Jacob Fish, known on his high school campus as simply Fish, 
is starting off 2016 by making a new batch of bears, stuffed animals, each with its own name, outfit, and even a birth certificate. But these bears are not for him. I always loved teddy bears and stuffed animals, so uh, as, uh, as a family we decided instead of selling artwork, we would just sell, uh, we would create and make teddy bears and we would give them back to kids in need. And you were five? Yeah, I was five. And now you're 14 and you have your own business card. I got a lot of help from friends and family members and they always supported me and donated and then just people around the community always helped out and it really helped it grow, fundraisers. And Fish was about to enter first grade when he drew a teddy bear on this bright yellow poster board and decided he wanted to do something to help other kids during disaster or tragedy. Fish operates the old-fashioned way on a cash basis. Well, this is my original money box I've had ever since I started my company. Uh, every time I go up to pay at the store, I just grab this and bring it up and pay my bill. So, yeah, it, when I was little. His business is building bears for other kids, and it's grown merely by word of mouth and a little bit of social media. So we give the bears like fire stations, police stations, hospitals, and jobs like that. And they, uh, when they go out on a trip, they would give them to kids in need that like lost a family member, their house was lost in fire, so. What is the best thing about doing this? Just uh, seeing everyone be so happy when they receive the bears and just seeing them thank me and just being so appreciative and nice. And Do you make any money off of this or no. have you put a lot of your own savings into we, this? We, we put a lot of our own money into this, yeah. Fish partners with a local retail store for good deals on everything from the stuffing used to fill a bear to tiny pieces of clothing and accessories. I, I try and keep the prices low on the stuffed animals so I can make more and more. And uh, I just, I, I get one and then I go stuff it. They have a stuffing machine. And then I find an outfit for the bear, dress the bear, and then they, you can make birth certificates for the bear. So, How do you know what to name the bear? Well, it, it, it gets, you have to think of a name. The, sometimes I repeat it, but like, uh, it, it's just creativity. And so you have to be really creative. You, you pick out the clothes, you stuff these animals, you choose a name. Life is harder now too. He's in high school and there's basketball, baseball and golf, and of course his friends. But somehow, Fish still finds time to make his bears. He's made 865 bears since he began. Seven photo albums. Tell me what they're, what's in here. So in each of the photo albums, it's pictures. Well, this one, this is my first photo album. And how old were you there? Five. I was five oh. years old. So this is me making my original poster um, that I bring to all my stuff. Me making my original cards. Me selling stuff originally. Look at this. How cute you are. And... Um, and going through it, it's just um, all the stuff I've made and where I've delivered them and everything. Oh, here's a bear in a diaper, bathrobe, and bunny slippers. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? Uh, it, I have made so many, it's hard to okay. really pick a favorite. Fish keeps detailed records for his bears. A collection of photo albums are filled with a snapshot of each and every bear he's ever made. Okay. He knows nearly all of their names and who they were donated to. Some bears were even custom made, depending on the situation. When Fish and his parents saw the horrifying news about a sheriff's deputy killed in the line of duty in one of his favorite towns, Big Bear, he immediately got to work, carefully crafting custom bears for the children of Deputy Jeremiah McKay, a hero in Fish's eyes, who died in a gun battle known as the Dorner Shootout. Naming his bears that time was easy. Hope, faith, courage quickly came to mind. A lot of the places um, delivers the bears too. He never gets to see the recipients, you know, a fire station, a police station. Um, and uh, those are all, uh, all terrific. But sometimes there comes uh, a, um, a special instance where uh, maybe a friend of ours or an acquaintance of ours or someone that just knows about his business comes to us and says, hey, we have some kids in need. Can you, can you help out? There was a... Um, 
principal of a, a local high school killed tragically in a car accident and, and had some uh, young children. And so a friend of ours asked if, if Jake could make those. This is a photo of Boomer, part of a group of bears that Fish made for children who had lost their homes in an Oklahoma twister. And there were the horrific California firestorms. The bucolic little area of Fallbrook had been evacuated, houses burned, lives lost. Fish was just five and a half when he met with American Red Cross volunteers to give his bears to fire victims left homeless. He had run back to the room where he dropped off the bears and he grabbed those bears and he was bringing them out to these kids. And so he sat down with these kids and he, he talked to them about 45 minutes like he was their best friend, like he had known them forever. And, um, and so he... Um, was that the, emotional? That whole it was. It was, it was. it was. It was tough to watch. I mean, it was, it was a proud moment, but it was like you know, kind heart. And so he, uh, he sat with those kids for about 45 minutes and talked with them. And the little one, of course, wanted the bear right away. Loved it, loved it. The teenager, she was hesitant. She said, oh no, I don't need a bear. You know, you keep it. Fish's parents get emotional when they talk about the many lives their only child has touched by making his bears. Just so proud of him. Um, he does good work. He doesn't like attention for his work. Um, and he, uh, Sometimes I just wish that the rest of the world could see through his, the world through his eyes. Perhaps some people do see the world his way. Word of Jacob Fish and his bears has spread. A high school cross-country team has helped Fish raise money for more bears by holding a yearly pause to the pavement fun run. This ambassador for children truly embodies the American spirit and has no plan to stop building bears for other kids. I have always want to... I've always had the motto that everyone needs something to hug and love, so just, yeah, just making sure everyone is taken care of and always is helped out. What do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I don't know yet. I, I want to keep this business going because I'm a freshman in high school right now, so I'll be in college in three years, so try and keep this going for another three years then find someone to pass it on to and keep it going. Rest assured, the American spirit is alive and well in our next generation, thanks to young people like Jacob Fish. I pray that we would be um, productive tonight. A lovely young woman, gone much too early in a tragic traffic accident, is honored by a women's group at Renewal Christian Fellowship in Moreno Valley. The California church is just 60 miles east of Los Angeles. Their task? Turn bolts of soft, colorful, snuggle fabric into blankets for children in need. Leanne Tonkinson was a 35-year-old nurse and mother of three when she died in 2010. To honor her memory and caring spirit, her lifelong friend, Andra Good, formed Lee's Blankies. The goal? Provide blankets that would comfort children everywhere. It's a project that started small, but through word of mouth, friend to friend, more blankets were being produced and making their way across the country and eventually around the world. The basic steps are relatively simple. Lay out the fabric nice and smooth, then cut it to size. Next, press out any wrinkles. Precision ironing is sometimes key. Turn and pin it, then sew the first seams. A turn to the right side, and then do a final finish stitch on the outside. But you leave the thread in here, so it's something I learned when I did um, drapes. Oh, okay. I worked in that drapery shop. Each blanket has a Lee's Blanky label stitched in one of the seams, a special touch to honor a very special woman. Um, this fabric has already been cut and ironed and pinned and tagged and it's just waiting to be sewn. These particular blankets are destined for children in foster care through a California Family Service Agency. It's just a good cause. Um, you know, this all happened because uh, a young woman lost her life and this is a way to give back um, in terms of you know making these blankets for needy kids so that they have something of their own and that's why we're doing it. The blankets are made entirely by volunteers at sewing groups throughout California and Arizona. Typically it's churches, PTAs or service clubs that sew. 
Often, a seamstress will ask for a take-home blanket kit that includes all of the supplies and instructions. Here's the community thread. What color do you need? Um, let's start with white. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And um, the tape measure and everything else is here in the rest of the bobbin. Awesome, thank you. Okay, what's in here? Tricks of the trade, what is that? Um, measuring tape, uh, small scissors, bobbins, and needles. You'll find each person behind the sewing machine has their own motivation to help. We have friends here in the church who have adopted children or are fostering children right now, and I have two children myself. And um, understanding just how difficult it can be to conceive a child naturally and have to go through that process can be difficult. And to, in order to support them, I chose to be here. It makes me feel joy and excitement. I know my daughter, she, she loves this little doll and she holds on to it and it's something that's very special to her that she likes to carry around with her and um, I just imagine that this little child having nothing would be able to hold and keep this, some, keep this blanket close to them and be able to carry it with them and have something special that means something to them. Since February 2011, over 5,000 blankets have been made by volunteers and given to children in many countries, including India, Poland, Honduras, Kenya, Mexico, Haiti, and the Philippines. It's really important because it gives kids something to hold on to. These little people have nothing else but these blankets sometimes, and so we just find it so important that they have something to carry with them from house to house and take to their next adventure. I'm just pulling the threads through so they won't show. So we, my husband and I are very aware that there's all of these kids out, not only in the world, but just locally that need love, whether it's for a season or a lifetime. And so we really wanted to commit our, our family to being a place that's safe for kids to feel loved and recoup and be rejuvenated, whether or not they're um, reunified with their family or if our family decides to be the forever family based on whatever happens. So um, I think it's incredibly important um, to have resources for these, for these kids. Lee's blankies offer something warm and tangible for children to hold on to, something to comfort them. Uh, Leanne was a nurse at Phoenix Children's Hospital, so she saw that day in and day out. Andra has taken this ministry and really grown it worldwide to give these kids something that's their own, that they can own and take care of and have for comfort and being a foster mom and seeing kids detained from their homes, sometimes dramatically, sometimes not, but not always having something when they leave their home to hold on to. I wanted to make sure that the kids that were being placed were being placed with something that they could clutch on to as they negotiated and navigated this new season of life. And they've done a phenomenal job of just encouraging participation and providing a room and ladies to come and sew and iron and just be a part of uh, making this happen. So that's been such a huge blessing. So it's like a lap blanket. Yeah, with the label and they're like the perfect swaddling blanket. I put Emma Grace in it and she, little burrito and I put her in the crib. She's good all night. And who's Emma Grace? Emma Grace is our newest placement. She uh, just came to us exactly two weeks ago and she is from LA County. No, that's my son. <laughs> she's from San Bernardino. I gotta keep him straight. Um, and so she's just joined our family. And this Hopefully, is a foster placement? It is. We're hoping for a permanent placement but we're kind of working through the system and seeing the steps day by day. So these are just some finished blankies that we finished actually the last sew night that we did. And this table, once we kind of get cooking, will also be an opportunity for us to make kits. So some of the people that are here or people that uh, aren't able to attend would love to make blankies. So they have everything that they need to make five blankies and then they can um, take it home, put the finished blankies back in here and return them to us.
Little known secret, he eats hamburger helper. As you can see, the fellowship is what draws some here. All right. Done, ladies. First one of the evening. All right. Well, don't stop working. Keep it going. Let's go. A gathering of women, part social time, but also time to do something that helps others. That's the American spirit. We hope you felt the time you invested in watching today's story was worthwhile. It's a privilege for us to bring you these examples of the American spirit. Some will touch and inspire you more than others, but they all in their own way contribute to the fiber and well-being of our communities. We are humbled by the people we meet and are always amazed at what they can accomplish, often by mere grit, determination, and perseverance. That's the American spirit. Join us next time for another stop on our journey, exploring the American spirit. I'm Mary Parks.